joining us. This afternoon, we are joined by Jonathan Rivlin. Good. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Jonathan is a CPA and his practice is with his father and brother in Owings Mills. Jonathan will be talking in a few minutes about the Regulation 7216. Yes. Okay. But before we hear from Jonathan, I want to touch on a couple of items that came across my desk this week. First off, I realize that many of our clients reach out to uh, reach. I mean, I realize many of our members have clients that reach out to you to ask them to help with their FASFA, FASFA, right? FASFA yes. form. Um, the IRS now has a tool that can assist you and your client with this process. This is called the data retrieval tool and is now available to use for the 2019-2020 FASFA form. This tool is the fastest and most accurate way to, way to input tax return information on the FASFA form. Students and, and parents who are eligible to use the form can do this through the IS, IRS data retrieval tool, can access it from the FASFA site. So I think you, I mean, if this is something that you're doing for your clients, I think this might be a worthwhile yeah. to look into this. Uh, I've used it myself and it, it does take a lot, of, saves a lot of time. Okay, great. Okay, the next item I want to talk to about is data security. Just recently, I got notice from the IRS, even though filing season is over, the threat is always there and continues to be there. We're hearing from IRS that the data thieves are attempting to compromise your system and steal your client's data. Make sure that if you've hired a cybersecurity professional, that they have implemented a, di a data security plan. Unfortunately, the best laid plans sometimes can't prevent a data breach, but you know you can do everything you can to prevent it. Cyber criminals do not take a vacation. They're sophist sophisticated and, and ever-evolving techniques can, are looking to gain access to your system. Your, your system is like the honeypot for them, you know, because we as we have many clients and it's like, you know, this is like the gold gold here. So don't let your guard down just because it's the summer. Cyber securities do not take a vac vacation. They are working 24-7. So, so we all have to be doing the same. At this time, I'd like to bring in and welcome Jonathan Rivlin. Hi again. Hi again. <laughs> Jonathan, I know you've been talking with um, us about the Regulation 7216 yes. for many months in many of our committee meetings. And can you share with the audience, what is Regulation 7216? <laughs> uh, now remember, we only have a 15 minute program here. <laughs> uh, real, real quick, uh, just to carry on um, about cybersecurity. I had just gotten a phishing email oh, last wow. week that was really, really good. I almost clicked on it. Whoa! And it we have we uh, we have a, a digital phone service, and uh, when we get faxes, it comes in as an email. So we got an email that said, "Hey, you have a new fax." And what I realized was that was not our phone company. That's what Whoa. tipped it off. Oh, that so, is interesting. Oh, I better keep. Oh, that's <laughs> oh, a lot of us have that now. Yeah. So we instituted a new protocol <laughs> where it's like when you get an email saying, hey, you have a new fax, first make sure it's from our company. And then we actually log into our profile on the, on the phone and then can get the fax that way. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. <sighs> okay. 7216. Yes. 7216 is an Internal Revenue Code section. It's been on the books since 1971, and it governs the use and disclosure of taxpayer information. Taxpayer information is broader defined than personal identifiable information. So it's like personally identifiable information is the sensitive part of, of a taxpayer's info. Taxpayer information as defined in this law is everything including metadata which is um uh information about information that might be used in uh some of the cloud apps okay so metadata is say it again what is what is define metadata metadata is data about data that's interesting okay yes. metadata. okay so i never heard that term i'll be expanding more on this in uh upcoming issue of the free state account <coughs> so be sure to check that out and we also have a, a seminar coming up in at the end of September that's going to deep dive into 7216. Yeah. Here's so let, let's talk about why this is important and, and why when I first came across this um, bill I, or law, I uh, had to you know restart my heart. Mm. Um, so it governs two categories, use and disclosure. When you hear the word use, think advertising, marketing. When you hear the word disclosure, that is if you make use of employees that are outside the U.S. 
Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and think that most members of the society are not going to fall under disclosure. So you might be inclined to say, ah, oh, it doesn't affect me. But we all have to, we're all business owners and we all do some type of marketing and that the use side of it does apply. And so here's what happens is, uh, actually, let me digress. Uh, the main point of the law was to give taxpayers greater control over their information. And I have to wonder what the environment was like back in the early 70s. Yeah. There must have been a lot of abuse going on. And so they came up with this hellaciously uh, draconian law. It's actually a criminal act to run afoul of this law. It's a, a, a punishable by up to a year in jail or a $1,000 fine per incident. Not per crime, per incident. Per incident. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So here are some of the things <clears throat> on the use side of it that could get you into trouble. One is if you send out happy birthday cards to your clients and they didn't consent to to receive that, you've used taxpayer information in a way that's not part of a tax engagement. You know, you've done basic marketing for your firm, but you've also committed a, a, a misdemeanor. Uh, the other th the uh, other things is if you have newsletters or e-newsletters, um, if you send notices of like, hey, we just hired somebody or hey, you know, someone in our firm just made partner. Believe it or not, that's actually a violation of this law. So uh, it's it's jaw dropping in its scope and and what it hinders. And in this day and age, yeah, you have to market. So there's all sorts of questions about this. Like uh, in my discussions with other society members, people are like, "Well, you know, I just engage with people on Facebook. Well, is that a violation? You know, they opt in. Uh, I don't know." I can't answer that. That's why we're having the seminar. There's a, an attorney is going to put right. something together. What I would say, what I do know today is that the IRS has a very specific form that needs to be filled out. And if the client signs it and, and fills out, then you can market to them, uh, <laughs> say happy birthday to them, and, and you won't run afoul of the rules. Let me just ask a question here. Yeah. So say, for instance, John Doe, who is located in Columbia, has decided to move his practice and he moved his practice to Owings Mills. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to send a notice out, a letter out to all his clients saying we've moved the office. Is that like a violation possibly? So this is where I would want the attorney. Okay. To weigh in. Okay. You could read it. I mean, we're accounts, <laughs> you know, two accounts, three opinions. I could argue that it is a violation. It could possibly be. Yeah. But I would also say, you know, that's also a service, like mm -hmm. letting people know, like, hey, you know, if you want to reach me, here's where to get yeah, This is where I'm at. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a pretty hard law. It's it really it was updated in 2013. Oh, there's there's a rev or I should say there's a rev proc 2013-14 uh, that uh, has updated language, but with technology changing the way it is, it's already six years old and mm -hmm. it's, it could be obsolete right now. Yeah, it, it just really doesn't apply. So, mm -hmm. uh, so when you're thinking about the use side of it, uh, again, remember it's got to be uh, the the required form that they that the IRS has, um, and it only applies to 1040 series. So you can still do marketing to your business clients, but if they're Schedule C, single member LLC, or Schedule E, or Schedule F, that's under the 1040 series. Um, Interesting. Now, uh, that's that's new information. I mean, all the times yeah. that we've been talking about this, that's the first time I've heard that. So yeah. if you're doing a corporation for someone, this don't even apply. Right. Interesting. Okay. So I, I would still be cautious. Sure, sure. Um, so then on the disclosure side, uh, that you need to um, have uh, the, the IRS mandated disclosure consent. Uh, for 1040, 1120, 1120S, 1065. Um, and with that, it's um, on the 1040 series, it has to be separate. It cannot be part of the engagement letter. With all the business series returns, it can be included as language within an engagement letter. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, so the, on the disclosure side, it's... Uh, if, if it's someone outside the U.S., even if they're an employee of your firm, you still have to get that consent. 
So it's not, so that, that's where it's, you have to make a distinction between offshoring and outsourcing. Outsourcing, think contractors, you're going to a firm like, hey, just process my data, I'll pay you a fee. And if they were subject to the 1099 rules, you would issue one to them. Right. Um, offshoring is more W-2. Uh, they're your employee, they're just offshore. Um, and under both situations, you would need to get this consent signed. Oh, interesting, interesting. Wow, I'll tell you, this it sounds really interesting. And the amazing thing is, is that, you know, it's been around for many years. Yeah. And um, and Before like you I've said, yeah. And like you said, back then when they first came out, you don't. Yeah. I wonder what was going on at that point in time. Yeah. That they made to come out the, this law. And the interesting thing is, you know, it's almost like it was dormant. It, you know, yeah. for many many years. And now suddenly with all the cyber issues and yeah. the be the apps and the ability to you know be here and be doing work with someone overseas. It, it's it's come it's it's right. really shown itself again, and I think that that's what's so important about this. Yes. Uh, so one thing we've asked the the person that'll be doing the the seminar for us, we've asked them to do if they could, if it's even available, to see if it's been prosecuted. Uh, I was talking to um, one of the apps uh, representatives from an app that I deal with, and they were saying, "Oh well, you don't need to worry about that because it's never been prosecuted." I said, "Excuse me, I'm a CPA." Yeah. And <laughs> that. <laughs> You know, I don't need that hanging over me. I still answer to the state board of accountancy. I have a code of professional conduct mm -hmm. and prosecution or history or not. I want to comply with it. Even if I hate it, I still want to comply with it. Right. Um, the other part of this is as we get deeper in technology, uh, some of these apps are more forthright about their practices than other apps. Mm. And uh, another CPA who has a blog, uh, his name is Blake Oliver, he's out in California. He uh, did a story about a few apps. One's called uh, Gapify and the other one's called Botkeeper. And uh, they use AI or that's how they advertise themselves. We've replaced the accountant's brain with AI. Mm -hmm which itself is a problematic statement. AI, you know anything artificial about, intelligence. Right, right. 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 But right. If, if you know anything about the state of AI and what it really means, that's a very, very specious statement to make. Mm -hmm. Very dubious. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they, they would send metadata to an office outside the U.S. for the purpose of verifying their algorithms and testing their AI and improving it. And, you know, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you know, you have a product, you want to make it better. The problem is they didn't disclose it. And then all of their client, their clients, which are CPAs and other accounting and right. bookkeeper firms across the U.S., all of a sudden they're, in, they're out of compliance with a, a criminal law that could see them prosecuted and losing their license. And these, um, these app companies in Silicon Valley, they're not signing the return. They got, mm -hmm. you know, they they don't feel the pain the way we could. And yeah, so this gentleman wrote on this art wrote about this. Yes. And who was this again? Who was in, what was the name uh, of the of the bloggers named Blake Oliver? Blake Oliver. Okay. Yeah. And he's based out of California. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For I think he used to work for Intuit. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so. So then um, the app, one of the app companies pushed back like, oh, you mischaracterized it. And no, no, we didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, th that's the thing with with all the technology out there. We're still signing these returns. Right. It's on us. And whatever they say and whatever promises they make, they being these app providers, it's still on us. Mm -hmm. So it's just a. Um, Another thing that we need to be worried about, another, another, not worried about, uh, just another thing to be aware of and another set of processes. Did you ask your vendors these questions? Where are your servers? Oh, we're on Amazon Web Server. We're out of Virginia. Okay, you're fine. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, do you have an office outside the U.S. where you do some sort of data validation behind the scenes? Yes. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Now I got to get this other form signed before I can sign up, sign my clients onto your platform. Right. And I think that's another thing that we were talking about is that possibly that um, that we can ask. And the young lady that's going to be teaching the, the attorney is from Miles Stockbridge. It's a Megan Manchester. Yes. And uh, that's who's going to be talking. And she's uh, very versed in this topic and uh, is possibly maybe coming up with a checklist. You know, when you're going to get a new software or getting a new app, these yeah. are some questions that 
you know, you need to do to protect yourselves. Like you said, the yeah. buck stops right here at the CPA because you're the <laughs> ones that put your neck out there. So that's really important. So, so I think this is some really good information. I know you're very passionate about it because actually you just came across it, you know. Yeah, I've, so, yeah, I've been, this is, uh, had my 21st tank season and, you know, coming to all the society events for years and years um, and keeping up with continuing education, CPA review, you know, nothing prepared me for this. This Ooh. was, I always say when you're swimming with sharks, the ones you can't see are the most dangerous. Well, this was a giant shark that I didn't see. Right. And now I'm looking right at it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and a lot of our, our members are going to be like that. So so that's why we really felt that this issue was very important. And this is one of the great things that society can do is yes. by quickly putting together seminars and, and educating our members on these issues. That, Like you said, that yeah. we don't see out there. We don't see them. Do, and, and they sneak up on you. So. We, we talked about this at the May board meeting. Yes. And here we are. It's already on the books. It's coming out in September. So f it took us, what, uh, four weeks to put the seminar right. together. So it's going to be September 27th, and it's going to be from 8 to 12. It's going to be at Martin's West. We're going to have a full buffet breakfast. And uh, right. so the breakfast is going to be like from 630 to 8. Then we're going to do the seminar from 8 to 12. You'll be there. Megan Manchester will be there from Miles Stockbridge. And I, I think this is really going to be a very – very eye opening. Yeah. I really believe an eye opening jaw -dropping. and jaw dropping. Bring bring tums. Bring tums. <laughs> Extra strength. <laughs> yeah. So I, like I said, so we we're going to be talking maybe about the abs. What other you know what what other thing topics you think she's going to cover in it? Do you think? Um, well, one thing I'd like to see is so um, and this is something that I'm I'm planning on writing about for the tax tips blog and uh, the free state accountant is uh, our firm has made use of. Uh, of an offshore person who's amazing. Um, and uh, the way the the required wording of this form is, it's a little confusing. So I'd like to know if there's a, a way that the, the form could be worded differently, just mm. to make it clear to the clients. Um, and the other part is if there's a possibility of having like a safe harbor, like if you can say, hey, we've adopted you know, first of all, we adopted the required form that we're supposed to follow. And then we have like a checklist, like who opted in, who opted out for the ones that opted out. You know, we lock out that, oh. that client from so like our offshore person can't even see them. OK, so like they log into our server. They don't even see that information. So like if long, as long as we've done that, if we make a mistake, can we at least like not? We put in jail. Right. I'm sorry. I, I like to keep my license. Right. I mean, because it sounds like, yeah, like you said, <laughs> if you're making you're doing, a good faith effort. Right. You're doing your due diligence as much as you can. And, you know, you know, errors, you know, we're all human. That's yeah. the, we're all human. And, like you said, I wonder if there is a safe harbor for that. And, yeah. and you know, and I haven't I, seen one. So that might be something that the society would have to start advocating with, especially with the, right, some of the, the advocacy work that we do. Yeah. Uh, with the Committee for Professional Regulation, that would be a good thing for us. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I really want to thank you for joining me today. It's a, It's been great information. And like I said, you know, it's interesting. Every time I'm in the like three committee meetings with you and this is always this was continues to come up. And like I said, every time, it, even like you're saying, you, you're you almost learning something every time you go because you're saying, oh, wow, I wonder yeah. how that works with that. It's, and, a, it's a sweater. You just keep pulling that thread. thread. It's a little more unravels. <laughs> it's a... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, next week, we will not be having a show because, again, it's going to be 4th of July. I want everyone to take their time and enjoy their, their time with family and friends. And we'll see you back on Wednesday, July 10th at 830 a.m. And from there, we will be coming live like we're today. We're live here. And actually, where are we at? Bulger Center. Bulger Center, Bulger Center Potomac, in, Maryland. in Potomac, Maryland. Well, on the July 10th, we're going to be live from the IRS Forum oh. at National Harbor. So... Again, we will be down there exhibiting. We'll be at the booth at 106, and we'll be uh, be giving out so away chocolate, pins, magnets. And so if you have an opportunity and you're attending the IRS Forum in D.C., please stop on by at 106, booth 106. Say hi. We'd love to see you. We always like to see our friends and our members. And, very, well, they're, they're the same, friends and the members. We're all the same, right. right? And so what we're going to be doing there, you're going to have an opportunity to win a special um anniversary wine from the special edition anniversary wine from Ligonor Winery. So make sure you stop by and put your name in to win the wine. Again, I'm going to wish everyone a 4th of July. Jonathan, you. I hope you have a wonderful 4th Thank of July with the family. Until next time, we'll see you on July.